Well, hello there, and welcome back to this episode of Fabulous Folklore Presents. This time I'm talking to Chris Fissack, who earned her bachelor's degree in English from the College of William and Mary, her Master of Liberal Arts from the University of Richmond, and did further graduate work in fiction through the University of Iowa. She taught college writing courses at schools including Virginia Commonwealth University before stepping away from the classroom to pursue her own writing work. Chris has been spotlighted in Writer's Digest and HuffPost for her work as an editor and author dedicated to helping other writers. She's the author of the novel The Baba Yaga Mask and the forthcoming work Becoming Baba Yaga, which is what we're going to be talking about. Chris fully believes that well-written words and well-told stories have always changed the world and that they will continue to do so. So in this chat, we're going to be talking about Baba Yaga's towering presence in folklore, some of the legends in which she appears and why she's still so important here in the 21st century. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to Fabulous Folklore. Hello, happy to be here. Thank you. It's so cool. Honestly, like Baba Yaga is such a fascinating character and obviously, you know, people like to sort of delve into it a lot more. So I'm really thrilled to have you here because you are obviously quite the expert on Baba Yaga. So... She's my favourite thing to talk about, really. <laughs> <laughs> and also before we get started the book as well the illustrations are so beautiful the really they? Cool stories to life don't they they really do I was so blown away the first time I was connected with those illustrations um it, any art form is just heightened when you get to partner with people from different mediums and yes I'm just again so honored to work in that space too that's so cool so first of all what first brought you to Baba Yaga as a figure and what kind of really got you interested in it to start with? Well, I grew up in a Ukrainian-American household where a lot of Ukrainian culture and tradition and beliefs was intertwined with our everyday American life. Um, and when you're growing up, you don't realize sometimes a unique situation that you're in and you just figure, well, everybody switches languages when you go to your grandparents' house and everybody has certain belief systems um, and different understandings of folk tales and stories. But it hit me at some point, um, mid childhood, maybe adolescence, understanding the difference between my grandparents' deep faith in Christianity and how that existed in parallel to a deep faith and understanding of witches and how both existed at the same time. And I knew Baba Yaga as a character, but then I came to realize my grandmother's understanding of Baba Yaga as a presence when she was a child. So that was the first time I kind of paused and said, wait, there is more to explore. And I don't think I've stopped exploring since. <laughs> yeah, because this is the thing, I think, because I know you mentioned in the book about the fact that you know, the, your experience of the forest is obviously very different from your grandmother's experience yes. of the forest. So. Have you gotten the chance at any point to sort of visit the same forests that your grandmother would have known? I have gotten very close to the Ukrainian forests of her childhood. I've gotten a couple hundred miles away. I've been very close with Slovakia and very close with Poland. Um, she grew up in Western Ukraine. But the time of my visit a number of years ago was a time of uh, political upheaval, violence happening in Ukraine. And while I had planned my trip, to go to Ukraine in that moment. We actually had a last minute pause on our itinerary, which was incredibly sad um, for personal reasons as well as professional reasons to um, kind of pause and not get all the way there. But we were within the same mountain regions, within the same general forests. Um, and what blew me away is I'm on the East Coast of the United States in Virginia. Our mountains look very similar. And that parallel kind of warmed I don't know, the blood in my veins. I don't know. It just, it made me feel like there's a connection here that I hadn't even realized, which gave me some further understanding. That's cool. So how would you describe Baba Yaga for anyone who, and I can't believe anyone listening won't be familiar with her, but just on the off chance someone isn't familiar, how would you describe Baba Yaga to someone new to her? And it's so funny because Baba Yaga is so hard to put into a couple sentences in some places in modern media and movies and film and all the places she, and comics, all the places she's popping up lately. She's just this evil witch character. But I promise you that's she's so much more 
in depth than this evil witch character. She is an old wise woman of the woods who has an understanding of nature and animals and an ability to transform individuals who come visit her to new strengths of who they could be. Um, she has an understanding of medicine. She has an understanding of just so many things of life and death. Um, my favorite little piece that everybody knows, well, maybe not everybody, my favorite piece that many people know about Baba Yaga is that she lives in a hut deep in the woods and her hut stands upon chicken legs. And so her hut um, may be where you thought it might be, but it might be somewhere else because it might have walked away. Or if you approach her hut and she doesn't want to see you, her hut can stand up and turn itself around. Um, who has a hut on chicken legs? I kind of want one, <laughs> um, but I love that detail about her. Yeah, I think the hut thing was the thing that probably first caught my eye, and I'm like, oh, wow, that would be amazing. Someone's annoying me. I could just go somewhere. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's kind of the tiny house phenomenon, the hold back to the woods phenomenon. I mean, who doesn't want to have a little bit of escapism with a house on chicken legs? <laughs> <laughs> And I think what's really interesting is even the way that you describe her, and obviously you mentioned this in the book that in uh, Russian grammar, she's depicted as having like no counterparts. Right. So would you say that she's literally unique in terms of sort of culture and so on? Absolutely. And so many world storytelling traditions and in so many world belief systems, you have this dichotomy of good versus evil. She's neither. Um, she's not a pure trickster. She's not a pure classical villainous witch in that capacity um, of the storybook variety. Um, she is not, she doesn't fit into a box. She is at once um, your maiden mother and crone in one. She is wonderfully complex and that's why I had to write a book because she wasn't someone who you can really sum up in a couple chapters or in a single essay. Is there anything about sort of the region as a whole or the style of storytelling that would explain why she's so unique or is she just that kind of figure? I think in Slavic regions today, but for also centuries, thousands of years, there has been a reverence for the female that shows up again and again, and again, again, I'm Ukrainian, but when you hear of Russia referred, you hear of mother Russia. When you hear of all of these divinities of the past, um, there are statues who have gone up in the Slavic pantheon of deities to all these female goddesses in equal places to the male. If you go back thousands upon thousands of years to ancient civilizations that were around the same time as the ancient Egyptians, there is proof of divine feminine being worshiped in that places. This belief in female strength is very deep, especially an idea of, some cultures have this idea of an old man of the mountain. And I think in Slavic society, it's the old woman who is both feared and revered. And I think that is, there's some power in that. Yeah, it's funny. I had um, Daniela on talking about Romanian fairies, and she mentioned mm -hmm. Mama Poduri, who I think mm -hmm. is a similar sort of forest protectress, but also not somebody that you'd necessarily want to encounter. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that's what I love about Baba Yaga is how she presents herself to you really depends on how you present her, yourself to her. That if it's not a matter of giving her gifts or giving her reverence, it's a matter of showing yourself and she's very consistent in all of her kind of storytelling traditions for hundreds of years is if you prove yourself brave, if you prove yourself um, a good hearted person, if you prove yourself respectful, and if you prove yourself hardworking, if you prove yourself those four character traits, she can act almost in a fairy godmother like capacity, helping you with whatever it is you need. But if you're rude, if you're spiteful, if you're um, out purely for selfish reasons, she will then, according to the stories, may or may not harm you. <laughs> but if, if you are a hard worker in all of these capacities, it's a great way to think about our daily life if we met Baba Yaga today in this moment. 
how would she judge you? And it's a different way to think about our daily life. And again, that's why I think she's so relevant to a contemporary conversation. She's a, someone who's a life coach in a very unexpected way. Yeah, I do get the feeling she would give the harshest of pep talks, but it would be oh, she totally talk would. you needed. <laughs> she would rip you apart, but if you could get through it, there would be nuggets of brilliance in there. <laughs> <laughs> And it's really interesting when you consider, you mentioned obviously about, you know, even some of the contemporary um, issues in the region, but it's, you know, lots of borders have moved and, and things like that. And obviously, the, you know, the region has obviously been in, in flux over time, mm -hmm. but yet Bobby Yaga still continues through the story. So why is her legend, and I know you mentioned about the, the, the feminine earlier, but why her specifically compared to other female characters? Why is she endured where maybe other characters or figures have, have sort of fallen out of the limelight as it were right I think the best answer to that there is a Baba Yaga historian is that what we can say a Baba Yaga historian called um named Andreas Johns and he likes to equate Baba Yaga to a metaphor of a plow because a plow what does it do it rips apart the earth so that something beautiful and new can grow and prosper. So it's this harsh existence that you have to be really, really rough so that something new can grow. In this region, just think about this for a moment, think about the climate, think about the constant wars over so many borders. Um, I'm not gonna speak on Ukrainian independence on this podcast, but there are so many struggles for life, for dignity, for independence, for owning one's own identity. And through it all, for those who are brave, who those who remain respectful, remain their best selves, remain hardworking through it all, you know what? Those who make it through can prosper, can survive, can thrive. And that region has been through so much. Um, and I think that idea of sometimes you have to rip it up, sometimes the ripping up just happens and you have no control over things being ripped up, but knowing at the end of it, beautiful things can bloom that really sticks with me of why Baba Yaga as a figure has endured for centuries because and millennia, because there are harshness in life. I mean, we're living in one of those moments right now, depending on where you are on the globe, but you could say it's a bit universal. There's some scary stuff going on right now. There is some horror and some terror. And when we pause and look at news feeds, when we pause and look around us, it's very easy to be scared. And figures like Baba Yaga remind us that there has always been terrible things in the world. There's always been darkness. But if we keep on keeping on, if we keep being our best selves through it, the world can survive. We can survive. We can bloom and we can help the world transform if we keep being our best selves. And I think that's why she resonates so much over such a long history and especially today. The world needs to understand that even through the darkness, great things can come. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting as well that she's an older woman, because obviously yeah. we know from Hollywood that, you know, once you get yes. past a certain age, you just disappear. Right. And I think it's also that sense of like respecting your elders, because in so many parts of the West in particular, like the elderly are just kind of pushed aside and ignored. And yet here you actively seek her out. You might not necessarily right. want to, but you actively seek her out. And obviously, right. like, look for her wisdom, I guess, really. Yes. Yes, exactly. In so many of the stories, you have someone seeking her out because she's the only one who knows, I don't know, where um, Koshi the Deathless, the immortal wizard, lives. She's the only one who knows where the entrance to the world of the dead is. She's the only one who knows insert wisdom here um and people are always terrified to go see her but there is a level of respect there too because she is old she might be terrifying in appearance um she might be terrifying because of sh what she could do to you but she knows all um in some of the stories it makes me very happy that i think in storytelling there is a desire sometimes to tie things up in pretty little bows. And in some of the very rare stories, Baba Yaga is married to Koshi the Deathless, who is this immortal wizard. But even when they're married, she's the more powerful one. And that just makes me happy. <laughs> it's interesting as well when you mentioned about the, the relationship that she's got with like the world of the dead, because 
most of the stuff that I'd seen in that kind of like pop culture sense is obviously about her as a witch or whatever. Yes. So I hadn't really realised that she had that much of a role in kind of guiding people out of the world in the same way that she guides them into it. So could you talk a little bit more about Baba Yaga as a psychopomp? Because I, just, I mean, I love psychopomps anyway, but I just thought that was a really interesting concept that she's kind of there when you come into the world and she'll be there when you go out of it as well. Exactly. Um, I've heard her referred to um, by some historians, and this really took off in the 1980s, this idea of Baba Yaga as the ancient Slavic goddess of death and regeneration. And I really like that concept. And they kind of consider her like a midwife, that she is there for one at the moment they come into the world. And she is there to help guide the soul to wherever happens to be next. And I think so often the second you start talking about a partner with death, people go to very macabre places where this is a horror movie type setting. But it's actually so powerful to imagine her as this partner in transition because that's what she is. Sometimes I've heard her hut itself, this hut on chicken legs. Sometimes I've heard that for when protagonists enter her hut, it's a bit like a womb. It's a place for people to grow and develop. And when they emerge from her hut, they are born anew. And I think that's a fascinating concept um, of her hut. But yes, this idea of her as a midwife, there are so many connections with her and birds, whether it is her hut on chicken legs, whether it is sometimes her um, appearance sometimes is very bird-like in different things. There's an old Ukrainian folktale about how birds are the only creatures on earth who know the way to the world of the dead, the realm of the dead. And birds often fly away and we don't know where they go, but they're going to visit those who have come before. But the thing about birds, they love humanity. So they always come back to the land of the living. And when you have Baba Yaga with all of these bird little connections, you have to think, well, where is the tie-in between all of these legends, between birds and death and her realm um, as we know her today? I'm just thinking, given they've just done the remake of The Crow, that would have been very different if they'd had like Baba Yaga <laughs> in it instead. Totally true. Totally <laughs> true. <laughs> And this is the thing as well. I was quite surprised that she's never really the main character yeah. in any of the stories, but yet the stories couldn't work if she wasn't in them. So is she in a way more important than the characters or yeah. is she kind of like the catalyst for what needs to happen to them? Exactly. I I love um, that question so much because it's absolutely true. The protagonists in folktales, I mean, think about Jack and the Beanstalk. Think about Hansel and Gretel. These are not fully fleshed out three-dimensional characters. Um, and you could argue the same with a lot of Slavic folktales. We have Vasilisa the Beautiful. We have um, countless princes named Ivan. They're always named Ivan, <laughs> but they're very simple. They have a simple goal. They have something simple they're up against. But when they meet Baba Yaga, who is the most complex person in this story? It is always Baba Yaga. Sometimes in the middle of the story, she appears and then she goes off screen and you're following the protagonist and you're following the protagonist. She is off screen doing who knows what adventure and who knows what quest goals or things that she's accomplishing. We don't get that part of the story, but then she comes back and transformation occurs. You said that she is this catalyst and that's absolutely what she is. She is always the complexity that makes the, she's the change agent of the story. And she's fascinating in that way. But you're right. She There are very few tales where she's the main character. And the only reason I even will say few is because I feel like they're modern invention. And now that people are really putting her in the spotlight, you're starting to see her pop up a little bit more. And people like playing with storytelling. So, of course, she will go in 100 different directions. Baba Yaga is the ultimate game of telephone. I swear she has been a game of telephone that has been going for about 7,000 years and she's still going today. Yeah, you kind of wonder where she's going to go next, don't you? Right, exactly. I'm really waiting for the Baba Yaga feature film where she is the main character and it's going to be something like, um, what is it, uh, Disney's Maleficent, 
where suddenly you have this whole backstory of this evil witch character from Sleeping Beauty, and then it's going to be like the Baba Yaga story, and I'm I'm waiting for it. Or I'll write it. Maybe I'll write it. <laughs> I, I kind of feel like I don't really want to know her backstory, because I quite oh. like the fact that she's... Because to me, she's like a, a really like badass version of Gandalf, where she just kind of turns up, does a thing, and then wanders off again. So I yes. kind of quite I quite like the fact that I don't really know a lot about her. That's, that's absolutely fair. I, I like it. And it's fun because... The entire reason um, this non nonfiction book, Becoming Baba Yaga, Trickster, Feminist, and Witch of the Woods, came to be is my last book was fiction. My last book was a novel. It was titled The Baba Yaga Mask. And while she is a titular character, if you will, she's not a character within the pages of the book. She is an influence within the pages of that novel. She is a story that my two sisters tell between each other, like a code of bravery, whispering these folk tales that they've grown up with their whole lives, this kind of pep talks in the midst of all of this, where in that book, they they have lost their grandmother in Eastern Europe because she grew up in World War II, went through all of that, but hadn't been back on European soil since World War II. And she said she needed to go there before she died, goes, flies over, steps off an airplane, completely disappears. And these two sisters fly to Eastern Europe and are on a wild goose chase trying to figure out, is their grandmother hurt? Is something wrong with her? Did something happen? Or is she up to something? Because you know what? Their grandmother has always been up to something. And they're using all these Baba Yaga tales to kind of understand their grandmother, who's always been obsessed with Baba Yaga. And we're seeing it also from the World War II Ukraine perspective of the grandmother when she was a teenager, understanding the Baba Yaga tales. So Baba Yaga does not need to be a main character to be a major force within a story. I was, I had so much fun playing with that in fiction, but it wasn't until I got to conversations with book clubs, with literary groups, with universities, where I realized the masses don't know Baba Yaga as well as I know Baba Yaga. The world needs to know. And that's where this all came from. Oh, that's really cool. Because I think that there is that tendency for her to almost get used in that, like, one-dimensional sort of yes. ah, scary witch kind of template which isn't really fair and exactly. doesn't really capture what she's like so it's nice that you've kind of like made her a bit more well-rounded if that's a way it is <laughs> yes she's definitely a complex lady yeah that feels weird saying that you've like rounded her out because you think <laughs> would you dare um would you say that as well that it's fair to say that in a lot of fairy tales there's a character who kind of checks how you're good at something um, mm -hmm. And if you've got the ability to do something, but she's very much more there to test your character. Right. Absolutely. In so many of the tales, especially the tales where the protagonist is women, um, she challenges them with absurd tasks of cooking a feast enough for t uh, 12 men and taking a bag of black poppy seeds, dumping them into the black soil of her garden and saying, separate them. And the protagonists are trying to figure out how to do all of these tasks, but it's never about the tasks themselves. It's, are they hardworking? Are they clever? Can they figure this out? Are they driven? Are they seeing this and breaking down or are they seeing this and finding a way while remaining respectful to Baba Yaga, who is giving them this horrible annoying task um and many of them most of them find their way and the ones who find their way through the tasks it's not about how delicious the meal was it's about could you find your way through this challenge and if you can find your way through she'll find your her way to reward you and you're right it's completely character driven and is it fair to say as well that a lot of the time when somebody does get their way through a task i'm thinking more of the ones with the girls in here it's because they've been helped or they've accepted help from other usually creatures. There's a kind of like weird Snow White element here where like animals are helping and things. But it's like, is she also teaching people how to work with others? I believe so. And that's another tremendous point because um, let's see. So Natasha has help from a cat, I believe. Um, we have ha help from, um, and it's funny because it's, animals but it's also um inanimate objects sometimes as well sometimes it's a gate sometimes it's a branch sometimes it's a head well hedgehogs are obviously animals um sometimes it's a wooden doll um it's all sorts of things but it is about having faith being willing to open yourself up and realize sometimes you need help and that is okay and isn't that a wonderful lesson for all of us that you know what maybe we need to talk this out maybe we need to realize that we are amazing and we are so capable 
but partnerships can help the cause. Um, I personally would like to have a partnership with a hedgehog. I mean, I don't know about you, <laughs> um, but yes, absolutely. There's often partnerships that go into that. Um, yes. It's funny. I've got a couple of hedgehogs live in my garden. So I'm, next time I see one, I'm going to be like, are you actually an enchanted prince? <laughs> <laughs> I believe so. I have a different perspective. I've actually had um, pet hedgehogs before. Um, I've had two in my life. And it's one of those things that Sometimes when you dive deep into storytelling, and I had no idea the role that hedgehogs sometimes play in Slavic folktales, that I have this whole new appreciation is, have I always appreciated hedgehogs as an animal? Because it simmers in my blood that <laughs> that's, um, hedgehogs are just these good guys who I should just hang out with. Is that why I've always appreciated them? Is that why I've always been slightly terrified of geese? Um, is it because sometimes they're just partners with Baba Yaga and they're going to swoop up the bad children? Um, so, you know, maybe that's why I've always been terrified of geese. <laughs> geese are quite hardcore. The funny thing <laughs> with hedgehogs in English folklore is people used to believe that there were actually witches in disguise. And you think of all the animals you could take the form of that they believed it was hedgehogs. And I just think that they're so cute. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They're just so adorable. It's true. That's funny. <laughs> Um, so we've mentioned, obviously, Natasha and um, Vasilia, and I think most people, if they've come across any Baba Yaga story, it's probably Vasilia's. Is there a reason, is it because it's similar to the Cinderella story that we know her more than Natasha? Because I kind of felt like when I read Natasha's, I was like, hers kind of feels a bit like one of those video games where you just pick stuff up knowing you're going to need it at some point, but you're not sure. I love why. it. It yes. sort of felt like that. But I also quite like the fact that I'm like, well, I hang on to everything just in case it's going to be helpful. Um, so I, quite, I quite like the message but like why why do you think that Natasha hasn't maybe caught on in the same way as Vasilia is it because it's not quite as familiar to other tales or is it just that Vasilia's got better PR better PR sadly I think the PR engine is at work in this scenario um, I think so many different world storytelling uh, motifs go back to the Cinderella tale where you have a rags to riches story where you have a young girl and her stepmother often there are stepsisters involved it's a familiar motif and when you hear versions of that in from different places around the world you're like oh that's their version that's their version and I think people are easy to accept that and easy to feel comfortable with that um, Natasha I agree she's fabulous it, I love the idea of her as kind of the character. You have to pick up your pieces because you never know what will be needed later on. You're right. If you find an oil can in the middle of the road, one should pick it up. If you have a ribbon in your hair, who knows what that ribbon can be used for. Um, if you see a cat across your path, be nice because you know that cat might be a major player that could help you in the future. Or a, um, what else is in that story? Oh, or a bucket of tar. I mean, all of these pieces. I love Natasha. Um, she almost has a Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz vibe to her with just like the pieces along the way on her um, sans yellow brick road, of course, um, pieces. But yeah, she's fabulous. There's so many heroines besides um, the, the one or two that sometimes make the headlines that are worth diving into. And the same goes on the other side that we hear about all the Prince Ivans. We hear about the Firebird, but we, there are so many other fascinating tales that we can unpack. And it's interesting to see their changes when they go through English translation. And it's interesting to see kind of how they're discussed. Oh, my favorite other point to say in this conversation is so often when we speak of Baba Yaga, people speak of her as Russian. And I think that goes back to the translation record because so there are so many different languages in the Slavic regions who are familiar with Baba Yaga over hundreds of years. And yes, we might pronounce her name differently. She might be Baba Yaga or Baba Yaga. And there's so many different ways we could speak of her. Um, so often people say speak of her as Russian. Um, they have the best translation records. <laughs> um, I think there's a really good relationship between Moscow and St. Petersburg and London in terms of translation and publishing houses in the 1800s, and hence she became a Russian figure. Um, but I think it is very important for audiences to know that she's not just a Russian figure. She is a Russian figure, but not only a Russian figure. Is she called Baba Yaga literally everywhere that she appears? Um, there are some spelling differences sometimes, um, rather than the Y, it's more of a J. 
Um, and of course, we're working with different alphabets here um, as well. Um, there are a lot of Baba slight derivation on the yoga. There's a little bit of change, but sometimes it's like an accent. You go different places, you can tell they're saying the same thing, even when it's pronounced slightly differently. Um, if it's an old witch in the woods who lives in a house on chicken legs, sometimes the house has a rooster head. Sometimes the house has four legs. Sometimes the house is goat legs. Some, but there's always enough of a parallel that you can tell this is pretty much a regional derivation of the same character. Um, the version we are speaking of is the most common and she has the farthest reach, but there are versions um, uh, as far away as even like Bosnia has versions of her where she is perhaps giving candy to the children. So that's, that's a little bit different. That's a different vibe, but she's uh, called, oh, I'm going to mess up her name. So I'm not going to say it, but it's a, it's a Baba with an R and I'm not going to say it because I'm going to get it wrong, but they're just different versions, but they're all very closely connected. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you a question. I've completely forgotten where it was. Cause I just got really fascinated by that concept that like, she's just everywhere. She is like take a, a journey around Eastern Europe. And I really, that was part of the fun of writing this book is I have a lot of people in my Ukrainian community, but then I was really starting to dig out. I'm like, okay, let's go talk to researchers from across Eastern Europe. Let's go talk to friends and relations and people who I know loosely um, from that region of the world and just like, let me trickle out and let me trickle out and see how far we can find traces of her and her reach is far. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned as well about the fact that she doesn't just help the female heroines. And mm -hmm. I sort of think obviously, again, because most people know Vasilia, obviously they're not going to necessarily know about all the Ivans. And I like the one where the prince turns up and asks for her help and you can tell he's absolutely like, oh my God, like I'm terrified. But she's actually pretty cool with him because I think she realises that like he's not just throwing his, his authority around or whatever. And I think it's it's really interesting to see how she interacts with the male characters. So the ones that succeed kind of, they either submit to her authority or they demonstrate that they're worthy in some kind of way. Right. Would you say that that's sort of a specific character trait um, to Baba Yaga stories, or is it just the way, again, that they've been translated and passed on? Um, I like that idea, and I think it's it's rather true that those, she's kind of a initiation rites into adulthood for many of these young men that come to her, because it's never anybody who's um, older or married or wise on their own. It's almost always a younger man, a someone who's about to get married, somebody who is a teenager, someone who is going out on their own for the first time who encounter her. And sometimes she is a, a terror to overcome. And that is how they realize they are ready for adulthood, that they can take on this terror of the woods um, and they can figure out, wait a second, she's the source of all of this. So I must overcome her. And in others, she is someone who you need to go meet with your best possible manners, with um, all of the grace possible, with the deepest of bows, even if you have your pet wolf standing right next to you just for your own protection because you feel like, okay, I can't do this alone. I'm going to bring my wolf. And actually in that story, the wolf was actually the horse that was transformed. Other story. Um, but they always go to her seeking wisdom because they acknowledge it. And I think, again, it goes back to that idea of the deep wisdom of women that is so inherent in Slavic cultures, um, the respect of the aged, which is interesting. And again, not to say it is a universal quality, but I think there's a respect for older generations. Um, at least that's my understanding of how I grew up is that respect for the um, those who are older than you is an essential piece of life, of family, of community. Um, and I think of the older women, because really those were the ones who were surviving. Women have a, a longer life often um, than men. Uh, and I think the women who are up there, they know some things. And I think that's fascinating. I kind of feel like she would be an absolutely phenomenal agony aunt. Right. <laughs> Love it. That would be that would that would be an advice column I would absolutely read. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing that's really interesting that you mentioned before about sometimes she's married and then sometimes mm -hmm. she's not. 
Mm -hmm. and you just take whichever one it is at face value. There's a couple of the stories that you mentioned in the book where she does have at least a daughter, if not multiple ones. And the relationship between them often seems a little bit strained, shall we say. (laughs) Is there ever any indication of like what will happen when that daughter grows up? Like, will she then become Baba Yaga? Will she become a Baba Yaga? Will she just like set up a franchise somewhere else? Like, what are these what are these daughters actually going to do? Um, I love the idea about a franchise. Frequently, you have stories of Baba Yaga sisters, where it is a franchise type relationship, or they're in different locations, and they are different levels of power type thing when they're sisters. Um, However, there are frequently daughters, but often as she is trying to take care of her daughters, sometimes she's trying to make sure her daughters marry comfortably. Sometimes she's making sure her daughters are, are well fed, and she requires sacrifice from the people of the community. So Um, And I'm talking about like gifts of food type sacrifice, not anything more severe than that, um, to make sure her daughters are taken care of. But there's not really ever any story of her daughters stepping into her place because Baba Yaga is eternal. She will never be stepping aside. She has her place. Um, But the daughters are someone she often has that she is taking care of. Sometimes their daughters, sometimes their granddaughters. But again, it speaks to especially her affinity for young women, I think, whether they are, again, the the young protagonists in the story or her own daughters or granddaughters. She is always watching out to make sure those young women are ready for whatever it is that life throws at them and that they are prepared for it. Some of the stories are definitely stories of their own age where, sure, maybe it ends with marrying the czar or whatever it is, happy marriage plot. Um, there are uh, stories of their era and that often the tasks have to do with cleaning and cooking and that kind of stuff. Um, however, no matter what it is she is doing, she's always thinking of the younger woman, pr- women present, no matter their relationship to her. And how can she make sure they are best um, prepared for whatever it is next? And I think that's kind of the role of where her daughters and granddaughters come in. Because mm. you mentioned this in the book, but she doesn't actually harm any of them does she there's the she threat doesn't. Is there but she doesn't actually do it i know and that's what is again fascinating everybody thinks baba yaga is going to eat you um there are a couple of stories where she might take a bite out of you so that to be fair that that happens um but in terms of her having this fence of bones around her house that are actually her victims she often has a fence of bones around her house but there are actually no stories really again barring more modern games of telephone where she traditionally consumes victims or actually kills victims. Um, We don't see that side of the story, Um, which is really interesting because you think of her, she's going to catch you and eat you. It's a Hansel and Gretel witch in the woods, but she's not. There's, I mean, again, there's frequently the threat. There's frequently the near kill, but it never actually happens. And I don't think it's because Slavic literature wants to stay away from the scariest parts. (laughs) That's not really what Slavic folktales do. but yeah, so the threat is there. But yes, she rarely actually finalizes that. You kind of wonder, did she put the stories about that they were all like her victims just to kind of like keep people away? Because I mean, Exactly. I... <laughs> she started the rumor to just kind of keep, she's like, give me my privacy, people. If you come near me, I'm going to eat you. Eh, she might not. But I'm just going to put it out there because, you know, what? just give me some privacy and peace in the woods. I've had a long life. I would like to rest now. Sometimes people bother me. Sometimes my house is going to stand up and walk away. But <laughs> it's it's a good story for her. Mm. I often wonder what it must be like to be inside the hut when it starts walking. Like, oh, yeah. Like, is it a bumpy ride? <laughs> one of the stories I have in my book, um, I have one of her daughters inside the house when the house like stands up and lurches and shifts and then it like starts turning and you see the daughter in the window and she's just kind of like keeping her balance as it goes. And it is, it's a funny idea that like, well, you know, it happens. <laughs> so obviously um, you've mentioned a few times about all these modern retellings and things. And I think it is fair to say that she has had quite a booming interest in recent years. Absolutely. What do you think has fueled that? And do you see that continuing and people actually continuing to learn from her even now? I think so. Um, I mean, you could talk about, goodness, the John Wick franchise with Keanu Reeves um, and how 
his code name in that movie franchise is Baba Yaga. And then you see the subtitles underneath and it says Baba Yaga, Boogeyman. And then anybody who knows anything about Baba Yaga is sitting there like shaking their fists at the television screen because <laughs> that is not the translation of Baba Yaga. And I understand for subtitle purposes, you have to do something and you can't have a book in translation of who Baba Yaga is, but it kills me. Um, but yeah, she's popping up all over the place. And again, I think it goes back to this idea that we're living in a weird moment in history where there's a lot of darkness around us. And we're living in a moment where with mass media, how it is, we are seeing the darkness in every corner of the earth more than we ever have before. And the human brain was not created to be able to take in all of the scary stuff we see on a daily basis. So when we have a character like Baba Yaga, she gives us ways to access the darkness and find the hope at the end of the tunnel. She kind of finally gives us a way to realize there is horror, but there is also a way to get through. Um, she has definitely found her way into the spotlight lately. And I think film industry, music industry, she's popping up all over the place. People are interested in what's beyond their backyard. And she is definitely beyond your backyard. And she's a fascinating story, story to tell. And I think when people hear of her, I think it sometimes begins with that hut on chicken legs. But the more you learn, the more fascination you uncover layer upon layer upon layer. Again, that's why it had to be a book. I couldn't just write an essay. Mm -hmm. um, she's just this fascinating person with that speaks to so many different audiences as well, whether you are young and still looking for your path in the world and actually saying you're young to be looking for your path, no matter how old you are looking for your path in the world, um, no matter um, if you are an aging woman, if you are a mother, if you are a feminist, if you are someone who um, just wants to have a different perspective on world history and how storytelling has pushed and pulled according to what cultures surround it she has such a long legacy and the more you explore the more there is to discover about her but also about yourself which i think is the most fascinating part mm, absolutely so will you write about her again in fiction do you think mm, maybe i'm not sure um i have found such a happy place everything i've ever written um this becoming Baba Yaga is my fifth book Everything I've ever written has really come down to the singular idea that well-written words and well-told stories have the ability to change the world. Sometimes I've done this in a capacity where it's more of a writing reference space about using your own language well, telling your own best stories, writing your family history. How do you even begin to write your memoir? Sometimes it's been in that capacity. But my fourth and fifth book where I've had this pairing of fiction that is uncovering world stories and family legacies and unknown histories because when I was a kid I realized nobody knew the story of World War II in Ukraine. People knew the story of World War II from many locations but this moment of especially western Ukraine where my family is from this moment where you have Russia on one side and Nazi Germany on the other side and attacks from both direction and all Ukraine wants is to be an independent country and there's this Ukrainian underground um, freedom movement that's going on to just be their own nation. And there were these two weeks in 1941 that Ukraine was an independent country for two weeks in 1941. And it's just, these are the stories I've heard around the dinner table since I was a kid, but realizing no one knew those stories. So anyway, so that's where the novel came from um, and intertwined with these folk tales. And then the ability to write a Baba Yaga folklorish inspired novel, and then to follow it with the kind of like behind the scenes, here's the nonfiction, here's everything you need to know about Baba Yaga. That's I think what I'm continuing with next. I have a similar dual timeline novel I'm working on that goes between um, Southern Appalachia where I actually grew up. I grew up in the mountains of Virginia. Um, so it goes between um, Virginia in the contemporary world going back to 1920s in the same region. Um, but it's actually playing with Lewis Carroll, who clearly is not from that region, but the influence of Alice in Wonderland and all of those stories on the world. Because again, that's not a folktale, but it has the same power of so many folk tales. So I think I'm actually doing this a very similar thing where I'm going to do fiction with that as, again, not a character, there's no white rabbit in my book, but that piece inspiring the novel 
And then the next one will be the nonfiction where we're going to dive into the depths of Lewis Carroll, how he can change your life and all of that. Cause I, I think this is my pattern moving forward. So it's, it's been a wonderful journey. Excellent. It's quite nice to see that transformative power of like fairy tales and folk tales and so on, because I think so often people can kind of see particularly the, the kind of folklore stuff I cover they're like oh didn't people believe weird things in the past and I'm like people believe weird stuff now um, indeed and it is a good way of understanding how people see the world and they've perceived the world through time and then you realize actually humans aren't that different no and I think that's a fascinating epiphany that everyone should realize at some point. And I think people realize it at different stages. We think we're so modern and we're so evolved and we have technology in our pockets. And how cool are we that we can ask a question and have whatever search engine or AI answer in the next two seconds. But when it comes down to humans, what we want, what we hope, what we fear, what we want to teach our children, the legacy we want to leave, that hasn't changed. Humanity is humanity. And these folk tales are sometimes a way to access that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that's an excellent moment to lean on because it or leave on even because I think that is kind of what a, a lot of the modern interest in folklore, I think, is is how we connect with humans both around us and also backwards through time as well. Right. Right. Because history repeats itself, but people are frequently just the same. And it's fascinating. It really is. Well, it's been absolutely lovely chatting to you. Obviously, I will put a review of the book at the end of this video. So anyone, like, stick around. Um, but yeah, it's been lovely chatting to you. You too. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an honour. It's been an absolute pleasure. Well, hello there. I just wanted to quickly share this review of Becoming Baba Yaga by Chris Bissack. And I will say for all kinds of things around transparency and honesty and so on, I was sent a copy of this by the publisher, but what follows is my honest review. And I absolutely love this book. I actually literally read it in one day. And it's a beautifully illustrated book as well, so it's really cool to be able to read these stories of Baba Yaga because the format that the book takes essentially, I should probably say that first, is you have one of Chris's retellings of one of the Baba Yaga stories with then the discussion of it and what it kind of means and how we can interpret it afterwards. So each story is accompanied with really beautiful illustrations that help to capture a moment from the particular folktale. And what I really enjoy about it is, first of all, Chris has an absolutely beautiful writing style. So it's just really lyrical to read. It's really enjoyable and it's written in a way that you can tell Chris has a lot of very deep affection and respect for Baba Yaga as a character. So it's a really easy book to read. It's a really enjoyable book to read. And I think because you've got that balance of the folk tale with the interpretation, how this relates to the history of the region, how this relates to the literature of the region and things like how oral storytelling work and things like that means that the stories, because they're situated in context, kind of take on a much richer form. And you can see why these stories have persisted for so long and why people still continue to come back to Baba Yaga time and time again. So I really, really enjoyed the book. I highly recommend it. If you're interested in Slavic folklore, it is a really great place to start. Obviously, there's also a bibliography in the back as well. So that's always helpful if you want to read further. And I just think it's a really easy book to read. It's a beautiful book to read as well. And I think that if you like folklore and you like folk tales or you're just really interested in Baba Yaga then I would highly recommend it so that's five stars from me well thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that episode if you did feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too it also takes between four and six hours to research write record and edit these episodes so if you want to help support my time in doing that then you can buy me a coffee or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance. <laughs>